Um, I've already learned a lot just from being here tonight about uh, things like the metabolic perturbations. And I'm only going to talk really about the physical activity side of things on the assumption that that still matters. And I think I'm going to have to walk out of here tonight and find out whether or not it really does. But I come to this debate as an architect and a planner and somebody who really spends my life and that uh, in uh, teaching as well tries to excite other people to actually think about what the built environment can and can't do, how people use it, how it actually um, helps organizations and families and individuals achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. Um, so, is this now on? Oh, sorry. Is this now working? Doesn't seem. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, here we are. I just have to be very determined about this. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly canter through three different scales of what we talk about in the built environment. First, active cities. <coughs> then active buildings, and then active furniture. Okay, so if we take cities, we have here um, energy on the, on the y-axis, but not the sort of energy we were talking about with food. Uh, this is actually about energy used typically for transportation. And what you can see here is two key variables. On the one hand, the density of cities, and on the other hand, how much energy is used to actually help those cities work in transportation. And what you can see is that there's three clusters. You get the tight European cities, which are dense and use very little energy compared with others. At the top, you get the US sort of city, a later invention, mainly geared to the automobile, rather spread out, low density, and uh, that is um, more area per person. And, um, and a very high energy expenditure. Now, the very fact of having cities so different actually starts to um, say something about what it is that people do within them. So on the ground, what that looks like is very different grids. These are all different cities from around the world drawn to the same scale. So if you take some of the extremes, on the top left you have a, an American city, Mississauga, and Toronto on the, bottom, uh, on the bottom right, which are sort of big grids, long distances to walk around blocks, very long distances indeed. Whereas if you look at the bottom left, you see Rome, a very ancient city, full of little alleyways, full of a small scale of development, not too high, not too crude, patina, built up through many, many, uh, well, really many centuries um, and even millennia, um, and variations in between. Now, what that starts to tell you, just in your, if you're in the built environment world, you look at these things and you immediately know what that city is like to be in. And you can almost predict what the transport patterns are and how much walking is done or how much cycling um, or other forms of active transportation. Uh, and New York is a fascinating example in Manhattan, the one in the middle, because it has huge urban blocks. And in fact, it's actually quite an active city, as it happens, because of a very high density. So there are some cases where if you increase the density sufficiently, uh, you actually can stimulate activity. I think as we look... And, as we look ahead, I think what's really interesting is not telling people, please walk more, please cycle more, please use a skateboard. You know, we know that doesn't work. It doesn't work for the patterns of lives in these complicated cities that we are talking about here. But what is starting to happen is that bits of IT is changing the ability of people to do things differently in those cities. And these are just a few examples. Um, the the um, one at the top with the lovely trees is actually something called a walk score. This is used millions of times a day to actually walk, work out if I live in such and such an area, what is my walk score? And it's done on a very simple algorithm. 
really about density, about the distance to key services, and about the distance to public transportation. And on that basis, it gives you a score. And, on, and you could then decide, OK, I will or I won't work or live there. Um, and similarly, another one called uh, Walkonomics on the, on the left. And even TFL, who we always used to think of as the organisation that ran the tube, that's what it was about, um, and then it ran the buses as well. Um, and now, it actually, of course, runs bicycles and increasingly tries to get people to think about walking. Because basically, it's seen its mission as not about using motorised transport, but about making the city work. Other apps. I mean, I'm completely wedded to my bus times app. If I now know how long I need to wait, I'm much more tempted to wait and to use public transport. And that's the experience around the world. The more you actually have access to information about alternatives, the more you can rely on them, assuming all your systems are working, of course, then you actually do get increased use of public transportation with the active travel that happens at the ends of your journeys. So I think I'm quite optimistic that some active travel will increasingly happen in cities around the world. And of course, there is the example that um, is actually creating the walking bus for the journey to school. With the soci sociability of a bus, with a particular start and end time, with people escorted. And this is now a global movement um, and um, where people volunteer to help set them up and to foster them. There's some lovely research that actually shows the importance of the journey to school in actually increasing physical activity far, far more than the physical education classes at schools or indeed the uh, fun and games in the playground, if you still have a playground, if it hasn't yet been sold off as part of the uh, school changes program. Um, so I'm optimistic about these changes for active travel. Now let's turn to buildings. 90% of our lives are spent inside buildings. So while some people look at cities and say we'll get more active activity, more physical activity if we create more parks, more lovely green routes, more open spaces where we'll encourage people to do exercise, well, yeah. Um, but in fact, um, systematic reviews of the evidence on that don't actually support the fact that locations which have such facilities actually do more physical activity. <coughs> And instead, the more I look at these issues, the more I think we actually have to really think about how people spend their time. So 90% of time is in buildings. And if we wanted to do more physical activity, does that then mean that we just have gyms everywhere? No, because we know that those don't get used very much either. So clearly, that's not going to do it. It's not about bringing physical activity that we call physical activity into buildings. It's a more complicated problem than that. By the way, you might ask what happens with the extra 10%, and about half of that is spent in motorised travel. So again, you could say that that's again within some sort of enclosed space. So a lot of our, our um, focus really needs to be on those enclosed spaces. A huge amount of effort has gone into thinking, OK, we know what the problem is. The problem is when people are in buildings, they use lifts or escalators. They don't use stairs. So if only we give them good information at a point of choice, they'll say, oh, my, I didn't realize that. I think I'll walk up the stairs. Again, it's more complicated than that. There's a lovely piece of work that's just been published um, that comes out of the New York Public Health Department of actually showing pretty convincingly from about 19 buildings that what predicts whether or not people use the stairs is actually their visibility and their proximity to the front door. It's also to do with how many floors up you're actually trying to go. So if it's too many floors, you won't use them anyway. Um, and I also have come across another amazing piece of work where there's something that we call in the trade an accommodation stair. Um, an accommodation stair is recognizing that most of what we do in design is often about health and safety aspects. 
for example, stairs are usually hard to find and hidden. Why? Because they're actually there for fire safety. They're trying to deal with another aspect of health, not the physical activity aspect. So if we instead want to have an, a stair that encourages people to use it that's very visible, it won't have fire safety. Uh, we call it an accommodation stair. And a lovely study in a not very high building looked at um, how many trips were taken over half a year between two halves of the building, one of which had an accommodation stair, another which had one of these hidden stairs. And it was actually 33 times as much use. Absolutely phenomenal, uh, phenomenal amount. So despite this not being a controlled study, um, it was you know, an amazing piece of evidence about one way of encouraging stair use. On the other hand, how important is stair use? That's something we're still looking at. So another issue is, again, how can we make um, stairs seem absolutely as attractive as, as you know, lovely glowing golden doors on lifts? Will that again make a difference? There's been many intervention studies done of giving various forms of education and publicity to choices like this, and you can get people to choose for a while, but then they often revert to the former <coughs> behaviours. Now, I'd like to mention a study that um, I'm involved in at the moment with colleagues from, from the Health Behaviour Unit in Epidemiology here. We've called it the Active Building Study. We're focusing initially on office buildings, and we're really trying to look at the spatial aspects within buildings that might actually be the factors that make people get up and go. What is it that actually stops you being a sedentary worker? and actually makes you move more within the building? And how can you perhaps, potentially, by understanding that, then adjust some of the classic rules of the game? Because as designers, the normal assumption is, let's put everything in the most efficient place so that people move less. And in fact, that's perhaps um, a, a, the sort of assumption that, that should be changed. Um, so this study is ongoing. We don't have the answers yet. Uh, the study continues to the end of this year. Um, and we are very hopeful that we'll come up with some interesting relationships on those spatial aspects of the building. So now if I can move on to the third thing, active furniture. <laughs> we again have one of these conflicts where a chair like this is an amazing piece of technology. It took a very long time and a lot of great intelligence to devise something that was all seen as part of, of really musculoskeletal issues. How can we make a chair that's so comfortable, that adjusts in all sorts of ways, gives you just the right amount of pressure that you want where you want? And lo and behold, if you do that, people sit in them for a very long time. <laughs> so we're now starting to understand that perhaps this isn't the only way ahead for furniture. But we have cultural, um, in, in inherent cultural aspects that go for very many centuries where sitting, of course, the culture of sitting was associated with wealth, with being a prince. Anyone else actually didn't have furniture, sat on the floor, or in later years might have been lucky enough to have a bench without a back. And the thing is that if you have a culture of sitting that actually doesn't have an all-singing, all-dancing chair like that, you do keep moving a little bit. So there's growing evidence that perhaps those little movements matter. And a discussion that's being um, touted in the press at the moment, that sitting is the new smoking that sitting might indeed be, uh, be killing us. And some of that is just about sedentary behavior at home, not at work. It's about couch potatoes and um, you know, whose who's leisure time is nearly all just spent sitting. When the very activities that they might be in, uh, use, you know, engaged in, like watching television, don't actually require sitting. Similarly, to do office work, for example, doesn't necessarily require sitting. And so here are some of the examples of, for example, on the left, the sit-stand desk that's now being uh, used in, in um, many countries and some companies, uh, or the treadmill desk. Uh, now, you can't walk very far if you're really trying to concentrate on your work. Um, but part of the 
argument that's being used is that every little bit counts. Every little bit of extra movement, or even just standing and working at a desk, where in the end, as I'm doing now, because I'm already upright, it's very easy to be a bit more active and to walk about. There's not the inertia of getting out from a chair. And so, um, apart from the fact that some people are also saying that this actually increases communication, collaboration, and sociability in offices and may actually be stimulating parts of the brain that you really want to engage. So there's quite a number of complicated arguments going on there. So really, to sum up, Looking at these three different levels in the built environment, from cities to buildings to furniture, the real challenge that we have is our cities are around for centuries. Our buildings are usually around for at least decades, sometimes centuries. Um, our furniture, however, is usually not really built to last. Um, so there are some aspects which we can adapt rather quickly and without too much cost. When any change at an urban scale takes a huge amount of time, a huge amount of cost, a huge amount of political change in order to happen, even if it's just trying to make a modest change in the transportation system. So the duration and cost of change is a key factor to consider in thinking about the, if you like, the um, developing science of what we might be able to do in the built environment. I'm struck that more and more people are focusing on the built environment in the obesity debates. It's being seen as an area which has been under-researched. Under um, I would go along with that. I think we've got a long way to go, but this has perhaps <laughs> provided a little bit of a structure to think about that. But behind it all, really, is that whatever we do in the built environment, is only an option. And what one really can always do is find active possibilities, should you so choose, in any city, in any building, with any furniture, with the appropriate mindset. Thank you.